Making headlines on first at nine. Blowing across. Rains and winds cause havoc, especially in the central hills. There are 185 uh, houses being damaged uh, due to strong wind blown over Kurnagala, Chilochi, and Putnam as well. Unraveling bond scam. JVP parliamentarian Nali Najayatissa threatens legal action against his accusers. Maitri Gunratna made false allegation against JVP and especially me. We will take legal action against him. Amounting debt. Dr. Nalaka Godeheva charges the government does not have a clear economic policy. Acrimonious G7. Donald Trump stops endorsement of a joint communique after Canadian PM's comments. Says North Korea has one shot at peace. A very good evening to you and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Katrina Chang. Now on to your top story tonight. Rain accompanied by strong winds continue to inconvenience the public, damaging property across the island. Disaster Management Centre says that 185 houses were damaged yesterday due to the strong winds in the districts of Kurunagala, Kilinochi and Putlam. Electricity supply in many areas of the Central Hills have been disrupted owing to heavy rains in the country. In the meantime, extending their warnings to the Department of Meteorology states that prevailing conditions of strong winds is likely to continue over the island and in the coastal areas until tomorrow with winds of up to 60 to 70 kilometers per hour. People have been severely inconvenienced due to heavy rains and strong winds in the western slopes of the central hills. Electricity systems in many areas have been damaged owing to strong winds that blew across the island last night. The prevailing strong winds caused severe damages to transmission towers in the area of Nuwara Elia. Electrical inspector of the Nuwara Elia district claims that the Ceylon Electricity Board will have to bear a great cost in repairing these damages. He also says that due to the prevailing winds, the safety of these transmission towers cannot be assured. The employees of the CEB, however, are taking measures to restore the electricity in those affected areas. A house was severely damaged in the area of Madakumbura in Hatton after a tree fell atop of a house. <laughs> Owing to heavy rains, Lakshapana Reservoir opened three of its spill gates, Canyon Reservoir opened two of its spill gates and Kotmale Reservoir opened one of its spill gates this morning. Both the Castle Re and Mao Sakale Reservoir have reached spill levels. Due to an earth slip in the area of Talavakale along the Hatton Nuwarelia main road, vehicular movement has been restricted to a single lane. The earth slip also led to a collision between a three-wheeler and a scooter, severely injuring the rider. The Disaster Management Centre meanwhile cautions the public to trim the trees located in their houses that could cause possible damages during strong winds. There are 185 uh, houses being damaged uh, due to strong winds blown over Kurnagala, two locations in Kurnagala, and one location in Kilochi, and uh, one location in uh, Putlam as well. And five boats being um, damaged in that strong wind blown over the Putlam district. Still, the weather is not uh, prevailing as a good weather condition, but people need to be very vigilant uh, with that uh, particular condition. People are advised to trim the trees around their houses and own premises. And if there is any dangerous trees and other things being observed, in common places, they, they need to call 117 call centre number. So 10,000 rupees will be given uh, on the spot uh, and the damages will be assessed uh, by the officials, district officials under the supervision of the district secretaries and the funds will be released by the uh, irrigation and the Ministry of Disaster Management. Former President Mahinda Rajapaksha is sceptical of the levels of progress made in the fronts of development and reconciliation under the current unity government. Addressing a function held in the area of Kottava today, the former president said that although the two prominent parties in the country got together to form this government, progress is lacking. A new building at a social service institute was unveiled today under the patronage of former President Mahindra Rajapaksa. 
Five fingers are not alike, but in this country, even with two fingers getting together, cannot get the job done. The two main figures got together, but it exacerbated issues and didn't achieve what was expected, such as reconciliation. My life is now made simpler and I don't have to speak against anyone. When the two leaders are chastising each other, what we have to do is look on while clapping. People now understand what is happening. Following the event, the former president responded to questions raised by media. <laughs> In the meantime, parliamentarian Prasanna Ranatunga insists that the group of 16 members of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party who withdrew from the unity government must decide on where their allegiance lie. Responding to media following the function in the area of Minuangoda today, the parliamentarian said that they should choose between President Maitripala Silisena and former President Mahinda Rajapaksha. Pasuya, Neo Jatana, Dura, Idribatuna, Sudashi, Pananda Pule, Mantisumia. Mantrimir Sahoge, Nodunai, the Ekaba de Paksha Pirisa, Parliamenting, Ivatu, Dasaidena, Patrekutu and Dano. I don't know of it. Mrs. Fernando Pule contested from President Sirisena's faction and the other from the United National Party. We did not want to interfere in that. The reason I couldn't cast my vote is that they helped the United National Party win the Sidhu local authority in the recent election. If they are attempting to get our assistance while remaining in the government of good governance, that is something we cannot abide, so I objected. They have to decide whether they accept the leadership of former President Mahinda Rajpaksha and align with the flower bud or remain under the leadership of President Maitri Pala Sirisena. Their goal will be clear during the next election. Speculations surrounding the identity of politicians who may have accepted money from the owner of Perpetual Treasuries Limited, Arjun Aloysius, continues to dominate the political arena. Comments were rife on those who have already accepted money and those who alleged of it. With that, let's take a look at what was said today. Maitri Kunratna made false allegation against JVP and especially me in a press conference. This is totally a false allegation. We will take legal action against him. Our hands are very clean and we are the people started to raise our voice against this central bank scam. So we are continuing to raise our voices to protect the people's money and taxes. So we are with the people and we will take strong legal action against Maitri Gunratna and his partners. There's a famous saying that Somalians are renowned as pirates while members of the UNP are renowned as bank robbers. State Minister Sujiva Sena Singh earlier challenged during the launch of his book about the central bank bond scam that if he was proven to have taken many money, he would leave politics. It's the time for him to do that now. Apparently, Aloysius had distributed money among all UNP members who rebelled against Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe. <laughs> We challenged Minister Sajid Premadasa to publicly state that he never took money from Aloysius. We make the same challenge to Minister Kabir Hashim as well. Minister Fonseca was a presidential candidate in 2010. Even he took money. This is such a shame. I revealed the fact that I received money from Aloysius three weeks ago. I told them that if required, I can pay back with interest. Had we known that Aloysius is up to loot the central bank, we wouldn't have even allowed him near us. His money might have been spent during the presidential election and the general election. I doubt whether all politicians will have to walk out from politics. 
I wonder whether Aloysius had the dream of becoming the president after the 20th Amendment to the Constitution. Under the 20th Amendment, if one possesses the favor of 113 members, any politician can become the president. Now that he's having 118 people, we highly doubt his intention. We did not accept money from Arjun Aloysius. There are talks that one parliamentarian accepted money from him and distributed it to an organizer of the UNP during the general election. They say that many are involved in it, but if the government is working transparently, they should find out as to who accepted money. During elections, there are various funding activities going on. The court will decide the culprit after necessary investigations, and I cannot decide that. Not only the governing party, but also the opposition is also involved in this. Dr. Nalika Gudeheva is adamant that the government does not have a clear economic policy, indicative of the fact that it has adopted nine policies within the past three years. Addressing a forum on Sri Lanka's tax situation, Dr. Gudeheva said that as a result of this failing, the government has run up a debt to the tune of 3 trillion rupees since it came into power. When the government came into power in 2015, it was the United National Party that managed the economy of the country. However, we must remember that this is a joint government. Within the first three years, they introduced nine economic policies. Therefore, it is safe to say that this government does not have a proper policy in relation to economy. When this government took over, there was a debt of 7,400 billion rupees. But within three years, they managed to increase this debt by 40%. This amounted to 10,400 billion rupees by the end of 2017. In addition, they have taken loans amounting to 3 trillion rupees within the past three years. This means they have taken loans amounting to 3 billion rupees per day for the past three years. In 2018, loans worth 5 billion rupees is obtained per day. <laughs> President of the Court of Appeal, Justice Preeti Padman Surasene, emphasizes the need to provide proper training to lawyers in the country along with the judges for the enhancement of the productivity in the, in the judicial sector. Justice Surasene expressed these views at the commencement of the Provincial Law Conference held in Kandy recently. Supported by the USAID, the 6th Provincial Law Conference was organized by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka in collaboration with Candy Bar Association. The conference held across three days focused on various topics of discussion, imperative for the members of the fraternity. We, on the part of the judges, maybe where we have a GTI, Judges Training Institute, in which we train judges, and the things are changing, the things like electronic evidence and computer evidence, and those are new to us, and we need to grasp. There is no point in judges being trained unless the lawyers are also trained. Indeed, uh, I took this up with uh, several authorities. If you, particularly in this area, the computer crimes, the cyber crimes, and electronic evidence, but I know because I have been doing it. Last April was the last session. We had it in Canada. With that program, we have concluded training all the judges in this country. So we were wondering if the lawyers are not trained, there is no use because judges, as you all are aware, judges can do it on their own. The remains of the late veteran teledrama and film scriptwriter, as well as a novelist, Somavira Sena Naik, is currently resting at his residence along the Ambilivatta Road in Borala. Paksha and various artists and intellectuals today paid their last respects to the late author. Late Sena Naik passed away at a private hospital in Colombo yesterday at the age of 74. He was the scriptwriter of over 30 teledramas, including popular teledramas Dudaru, Asal Vasio, Palingumanike, Sitanivanakata, Yasho Rave, and Charita Tunak. The late senior journalist's last rites will be performed tomorrow at 6 p.m. at Godigamo General Cemetery in Maharagama tomorrow. Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel.
Father Verena 24-7. Let's now take a look at some other news making news across Sri Lanka. State Minister of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Development and Rural Economic Affairs, Dilip Vedarachi, says that starting from midnight on Tuesday, a litre of kerosene will be sold at 70 rupees. However, fishermen have warned that if the government does not receive a litre of kerosene at the previous rate of 44 rupees, they will refrain from engaging in work. On the 8th of this month, a group of fishermen commenced a satyagraha requesting a litre of kerosene be given at a concessionary rate. CCTV footage captured the manner in which an unidentified group crept into a residence at Dikbadda in Batapola and assaulted its residents at midnight yesterday. Police have commenced investigations into the incident. Meanwhile, CCTV captured footage of an accident that took place along the Bandaragamakas Babu Main Road. A motorbike collided into a bus flying from Bandaragama, which was attempted to stop at a bus halt at Kumuruvada. A motorcyclist was left injured when his vehicle collided with a car along the Homagama Hospital Road. The accident occurred due to a carelessness of a three-wheeler travelling ahead of the motorcycle at the time. Deputy Minister of Sustainable Development, Wildlife and Regional Development, Palita Tevara Peruma engaged in an inspection tour at midnight in areas of Anuradhapura, Horopatan and Morogura wildlife officers. During the inspection tour, the Deputy Minister caught an officer and his deputy sleeping in the office. When the Minister visited the Ritigala wildlife office, the Minister caught a group of officers who were sleeping on duty with their phones switched off. The Minister later lodged a complaint at the Morogura police. Chief Executive Officer of Doha Bank, Dr. R. Sitaraman, says that Qatar sees great potential in Sri Lanka's aviation sector and is looking forward towards facilitating a joint venture between Qatar Airways and Sri Lanka to create an aviation hub. Speaking at a media briefing in Colombo recently, Sitaraman added that Qatar is also eyeing potential investments in energy and food security in Sri Lanka. We have $500 million, nearly half a million, $511 million is a precise number last year, remittances from Qatar to Sri Lanka. We also know there are opportunities for free trade agreement between Gulf, Qatar in particular, and Sri Lanka. We are already working on various free trade agreement, multilateral investment protection as desired by the United Nations is also the framework endorsed by Sri Lankan government. That is a bigger opportunity for investment protection. If you look at the Sri Lankan skilled and unskilled workers throughout the Gulf, we have seen Sri Lankan in multiple respects contribute for the economic development. We also have bigger opportunity to invest in the agriculture and food security. The Gulf state Qatar is going through a blockade from the neighbors and food security is a major concern with agro-processing opportunities we have here. We want to invite food supply companies, food processing companies from Sri Lanka to Qatar. In the aviation side, there is no better position geographically than Sri Lanka. And aviation hub is what we want to generate. Tourism and aviation are interconnected. Qatar Tourism Authority and Qatar Airways. We want to bring this joint venture and partnership to invest in aviation. Most important side is the infrastructure, the airport, seaport, road, rail, express highways. There are plenty of opportunities in flat commercial retails. There is a huge scope for investments. China's foreign trade with countries along the Belt and Road routes has increased 11.1% in the period from January to May, year on year to the tune of 502 billion US dollars. The growth rate is 2.3 percentage points higher than China's overall trade growth at the same period. Latest data by China's General Administration of Customs show trade in goods has risen 8.8% year-on-year in the first five months of the year. The General Administration of Customs said countries' exports and imports with Russia rose 18%, while with Poland 12.1% and with Egypt 13.1% in the first five months of this year. 
China's central and western regions as an important joint of the routes have seen their export and import volume total 261 billion US dollars up 17.1% year on year in the first 5 months of this year. The Belt and Road Initiative first proposed by Chinese President Xi Jinping in 2013 is meant to promote policy coordination, interconnectivity of facilities, unimpeded trade, financial integration and closer people-to-people -people ties between China and the countries along the routes. Analysts say that over the coming week, local buying interests will remain low, adopting the wait-and-see approach to, to the prevailing uncertainty over political and economical state. However, foreigners will be active in the market during the bargain hunting. For a detailed picture of how the markets will perform this week, here's Archad and Sri Rangan from First Capital with our weekly forecast. Expect the market to continue with the slowness in the activity with the prevailing uncertainty on the political and the economical side. Local buying interests are likely to be remain low, adapting the wait and see approach. As most investors are looking for the proper direction in the index ahead of Fed rate and Sri Lankan policy announcement. However, foreigners are likely to be active primarily driven by the bargain hunting counters. Despite lower volume, we expect activity to be dominated by the blue chip counters. You are watching Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Dharana 24-7. Welcome back to the news. Disastrous and acrimonious are the words used to describe the G7 summit which concluded yesterday after US President Donald Trump lashed out at host Canada, retracting his endorsement of the joint statement. He accused Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of acting meek and mild during meetings only to attack the US at a news conference. The summit was marred by disagreements over trade and Trudeau described as Trump's decision to invoke national security to justify tariffs as insulting. This year's G7 summit grabbed headlines for all the wrong reasons, even before it began. When it did get underway, it was disagreements upon disagreements, mainly over tariffs. On Friday, US President Donald Trump called for Russia to be readmitted to the G7, a nation which was expelled four years ago after it annexed Ukraine's Crimea region. This caught other members of the summit unawares, scrambling the summit. After much effort in the final communique of the summit, the group of major industrial nations, Canada, the US, the UK, France, Italy, Japan and Germany agreed on the need for free, fair and mutually beneficial trade and the importance of fighting protectionism, saying they strive to reduce tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers and subsidies. Other agreements reached include a joint demand that Russia cease with its destabilizing behavior, a pledge to permanently ensure Iran's nuclear program remains peaceful and an agreement to disagree as the US refused to sign a pledge to implement the Paris Climate Change Accord after Trump announced he was pulling out of the agreement last June in the hope of a new fair deal. Later, the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of the host nation Canada had this to say. I highlighted directly to the President uh, that Canadians did not take it lightly, that the United States has moved forward with significant tariffs on our steel and aluminum industry, particularly did not take lightly the fact that it's based on a national security reason that for Canadians who either themselves or whose parents or community members have stood shoulder to shoulder with American soldiers in far off lands and conflicts from the First World War onwards, that it's kind of insulting. Canadians were polite, were reasonable, but we also will not be pushed around. This, however, did not go down well with the US president as he lashed out at Trudeau. Trump took to Twitter and said, PM Justin Trudeau of Canada acted meek and mild during the summit, only to give a news conference saying that US tariffs were kind of insulting and he will not be pushed around. It wasn't all. Trump went on to say that on the back of the false statement delivered by the Canadian leader, Trump has instructed not to endorse the summit's communique. In the meantime, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and US President Donald Trump have both arrived in Singapore for their scheduled summit meeting. The historic meeting between the two leaders will take place at the island resort of Sentosa on Tuesday. 
The highly anticipated summit between the two leaders on June 12 will center on Pyongyang's nuclear programming and economic assistance from Washington. Before setting off, Trump described the summit as a one-time shot at peace and said the two were in unknown territory in the truest sense. Security was tight at Singapore's Capella Hotel, where the historic meeting is set to take place. Checks were set up at the entrances and only guests or authorised personnel were allowed in. Now let's take a look at some other stories making news across the world. Sheep shearers participated in the competition in France on Friday, where they attempted to shear more than 2,000 sheep in 24 straight hours. The competition featured two teams of three shearers competing to see who can gather the most wool in one day, with the joint goal of setting a world record in team sheep shearing. It meant having to shear 2,500 sheep with only 50 seconds to shear one animal. It is proving increasingly difficult to keep US President Donald Trump away from news. An exhibition consisting of and inspired by the tweets of US President Donald Trump has opened in West Hollywood, California. The travelling exhibition entitled The Daily Show Presents the Donald J. Trump Presidential Twitter Library has already proved popular in New York. Part museum, part tongue-in-cheek take on US presidential libraries, the exhibit also doubles as a selfie photo booth for its visitors. Archaeologists in Peru have discovered the ancient remains of 56 children believed to have been sacrificed by the Chimu civilization. Truillo is affected by the El Nino climate phenomenon, and archaeologists believe the sacrifices were meant to ward off bad weather, and cuts on bones of the remains suggest that the heart was extracted. Local reports date the remains to between 1200 and 1400 AD. World number one Simona Halep ended years of heartache to clinch her first Grand Slam title with victory over Americans Sloan Stevens in the French Open final yesterday. The popular Romanian, who had lost three major finals, showed signs of nerves at first but recovered to outclass a 10th seeded opponent. World number one Simona Halep, who had a reputation for falling apart when it mattered after losing three Grand Slam finals, including two at Roland Garros in Paris, finally put her hands on a major title after showing great determination to tame American Sloane Stevens 3-6-6-4-6-1 in the title match yesterday. The 26-year-old had played two finals in Paris before losing to Russian Maria Sharapova in 2014 and then to Latvian Yelena Ostapenko in heartbreaking fashion last year despite holding a set and 3-0 lead against her. <laughs> Halep's opponent, 10th seeded Stevens, will break into the top five for the first time when the new rankings are released tomorrow. Watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel, Other Therana 24 7. Let's now take a look at your weather. A very good evening and welcome to Forecast First. Your temperatures for tomorrow are to vary between 21 and 33 degrees Celsius, with the highest of 33 degrees Celsius expected along the coastal line from Mulaitiv to Batiklo. Well, when looking at the map, a low pressure zone seems to be developing along the coastal belt from Mana to Gaul over the next 24 hours. Well, the sun, however, will shine bright in Jaffna, Mana, Trincomalee and Batiklo, but the areas of Vaunia, Kandy, Colombo, Gaul and Matara, as well as Hambantura will expect Shows. That's all from the Weather Centre tonight. Up next is your City by City forecast.
And before we go tonight, we'd like to take you to Provence, a region in the southeastern France that is home to the world's most picturesque lavender fields. By the month of June each year, these fields become the dream of every summer lover and photographer. Most famous of these fields lie in the medieval town of Valençol, where you'll find the longest lavender lines in the world and the highest number of acres covered in flowers. These fields are so endless, the horizon is tainted in purple. We hope you enjoy these visuals and have a pleasant evening. Bringing you the news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Varanar. 24-7.